But now it's 10.15 and it's time for the Moral Maze with Michael Burke. Good evening. So the government is to have another go at banning fox hunting. To my mind, it's a trivial issue. There are so many more important things in the world to worry about than whether foxes should be shot or chased to death. But the passions it raises are quite extraordinary and maybe tell us a lot about what sort of society we've become, and that is important. On the one hand is the hunting lobby, which justifies tearing an animal to bits for sport by portraying itself as a link to this country's yeoman past, its place in a natural order, its colourful traditions and libertarian instincts. On the other are the animal welfare activists, mobilising a largely urbanised middle class that is now disconnected from the more robust realities of rural life. For many, meat seems to have less and less to do with dead animals, and a soft-hearted anthropomorphism, fuelled by the media, it must be said, is the prevailing mood. The immediate question is, to, is whether hunting is to be judged as exceptional cruelty to animals and so immoral and unacceptable. But it is now much more than that. The central issue in a wider argument between town and country. Country people feel beleaguered and misunderstood. Their prosperity, their traditional way of life, their very land itself under pressure. While the importance of the hunts to the rural economy is probably exaggerated, while many country people may themselves disapprove of hunting, it has, rightly or wrongly, become symbolic of a fundamental clash of interests in our society. Is that right? If it is, should the values of the urban and suburban majority take precedence over the rural minority, and to such an extent as not to tolerate that of which it disapproves? Our moral maze. With most of our regular panel, Janet Daly of The Telegraph, the constitutional historian Dr David Starkey, Professor Ian Hargreaves, editor turned academic, and subbing for Dr David Cook, who's away, the lawyer turned crime writer Francis Fifield. Um, Ian. Well, after the unspeakable in pursuit of the inedible, I fear we've got the politically unscrupulous in pursuit of the insignificant. Insignificant not because hunting foxes to death isn't cruel, it is. Uh, and anyone who enjoys inflicting cruelty on an animal or watching it should be ashamed of themselves. But insignificant in the context of so much other worse animal cruelty licensed by government from factory farming to the scientifically questionable colour badgers. And utterly insignificant against the real issues facing country people, jobs, transport, housing and health. I think this really is one occasion when we of the tyrannical majority should show the courage to forego an easy trick. Janet Daly. Well, I very largely agree with that, I must say. I, I, since a, such a large majority of this country's population does live in cities, it isn't surprising that urban values dominate the political culture. But it's also true that ever since the trauma of the Industrial Revolution, uh, Britons had a particularly romantic attachment to an idyllic notion of the countryside. Real country people now seem to be caught in a kind of pincer movement between the steamroller of the overwhelming urban majority and the sentimentalised vision of their lives which sissy people want to believe in. But if the diversity and the freedom of life in Britain isn't to be trampled over, urban prejudices have to be held up for rigorous examination. The cruelties and the callousness of rural life are no worse and no better than those of the sissies, but they're treated with a lot less tolerance. David Sarkin. This is beginning to sound dangerously like a barber's shop quartet, isn't it, <laughs> with the uh, exquisite <laughs> agreement, um, which I'm not going to disturb. I think Ian, uh, Ian is right, and that you're right, Michael. It is an absurd and trivial issue. Nevertheless, it is obviously symbolic, and it's symbolic, I think, not only of all the things we've been uh, talking about so far, but of a kind of inversion or confusion of values in which we seem to have much stronger feelings and much clearer moral judgments about the so-called nonsensical rights of animals than we do of those of human beings. And that is very worrying. Francis Fifield. I must say, as a, as a one-time country dweller raised with pigs and chickens, but now an urban dweller, I've never had a sleepless night about the prospect of, of fox hunting. I think the polarity of opinion between country and town has got a sort of historical basis once the power was in the country, now it's in the town. Wars once upon a time were fought between county and county rather than town and country. And it's that perception that that is where power is, which I think is responsible for a lot of the polarisation. It goes back a sort of revenge, really, beginning um, with the Industrial Revolution, where people were driven out of the country to work in the dark satanic mills. And I think that kind of envy of the country, in a sense, still goes on. It's envy from an uncertain urban world of a world which still seems to be certain. Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Robin Page, who's the founder and chairman of the Countryside Restoration Trust and formerly presenter of uh, One Man and His Dog, of course. Uh, Robin, let's start with fox hunting itself first. Uh, straightforward recreational cruelty? Uh, I, 
I don't hunt, shoot or fish, I don't believe it's uh, recreational cruelty at all. I think it's one way of controlling foxes uh, and I think it's one way of enhancing and improving the countryside because the um, countryside which is hunted uh, has uh, a lot of habitats which are good for the fox and good for a lot of other wild creatures and when the general wildlife in the countryside is being absolutely stuffed by the industrialization of farming it actually gives them a respite the fox doesn't get a lot of respite but everything else does and so the otters uh, and the barn owl and the bee orchid and the badger they actually benefit from it because of the habitat left for the fox uh, and so as a conservationist I am totally for it. As a libertarian, I am for it because... Uh, I... Hang on, hang on. This is a, <laughs> a bloody political track, this is. Mm. Fra Francis Fife. As far as, as, far as uh, um, the hunting element is, is concerned, would it be right to say that it is a tradition which is dying? I mean, a long way from dead, but is it dying? Is it true to say that hunt saboteurs and public opinion has diminished it to a great extent over the years? I, I'm currently writing a book called The Hunting Gene, and I'm going to a lot of hunting areas, and I would say around urban centres it's dying because of motorways and housing estates where it's traditionally taken place such as the Lake District uh, the Cotswolds, Exmoor it is stronger than it's ever been and what is interesting too that it is a living culture that it involves whole communities and they're totally um, behind it and it's a year long activity uh, and so I believe that in days of multiculturalism to see it attacked in this way um, makes me wonder what exactly people mean yes, by it's, multiculturalism. It's, 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 it's scarcely democratic. Can I open it out a bit from the fox hunting thing? Um, what I perceive as one of the problems that so many country dwellers have on a wider issue, leaving aside the hunting, is that so many country dwellers and workers do not actually own the land they work. It is always a question of it being owned by somebody else, or very often a question of it being owned by somebody else. Do you think that helps to the that adds to the general sense of frustration? Uh, so no, I don't. Because farms. everybody, if everybody owned the the land they worked on, we would ba be back to a peasant culture. Now, I wouldn't actually object to that because <laughs> my life is almost like that anyway. Well, perhaps. perhaps. Um, but on a realistic basis, um, the whole trend of common agricultural policy is forcing the small landowner off the land. Well, maybe the ownership, the ownership isn't so, so important, but, but this a, is a, lack part, of, a lack of control but is this what is I meant. part of the problem. Uh, the whole farming industry and the whole rural community is under huge economic and social pressure. Who do, who do you see and as governing your fortunes? Governing? Brussels, without any shadow of doubt political decisions are being made at the mo moment which are ruining farming families throughout the land and there is almost uh, uh, not a clearance of the of the highlands going on there is soon to be a clearance of the lowlands as well uh, uh, ethnic cleansing cultural cleansing economic cleansing on a massive scale which makes the whole kosovo uh, situation very peculiar that's Balderdash, isn't it? Certainly isn't Balderdash, no. Um, well, because it's massive exaggeration. I, I, think, I think there are certainly comparisons uh, because we have a rural culture here which is dying and it's being screwed out of existence. Ian Harvey. Well, I, I think it is a pretty wild exaggeration, all of that, but I'd like to take you to the issue of cruelty. Um, I don't disagree with you. Um, I don't think anybody particularly disagrees that fox, the fox population needs to be controlled. Do you think that there is a moral issue at stake um, when people choose to enjoy a display of killing? I mean, is it okay? Uh, the, the first thing that you have to realise is when you follow a hunt, not many people see the kill, and I followed several for this book, and I haven't seen one yet, and so it is the actual hunting that they enjoy. Yeah, OK, but, I, but, I accept that, but, but answer that, are, that part of the question. It clearly does apply to part of the experience. My is it morally questionable? I, I believe that hunting foxes and hares are as close to nature as you can get. And I have moral problems with shooting 
and fishing, and I would find it harder to justify shooting and fishing than hunting. And this is what makes legislation so strange, because the one which is most the most easy to defend from a cruelty point of view is the one that is attacked most because urban man is not used to seeing death and but, bodies. But, but you, and but, in hunting, but, they see a body, and it's a body that is ripped up after it is dead, and this is what is... Uh, it's uh, aesthetically displeasing to them. David Starkey. Robin, I'm a bit puzzled by what you've been saying, uh, not because I disagree with it, well, I but am because... Well. I'm sure. <laughs> but because I thought that we had a very large, heavily endowed, specially privileged body that was responsible for looking after these yeah, areas you're talking about, the Lake District, large parts of Exmoor, called the National Trust, which is dedicated to preserving all these wonderful, quaint rural ways of life, isn't it? The National Trust is men in suits with no roots and no <laughs> culture, telling people without suits and roots and culture how to live their lives. And I find it f distressing uh, to see politically correct people telling country people how they must run their lives. And for instance, in the Lake District recently, I was talking to a farmer in financial despair who has actually suffered a 50% reduction in his income in a year, and the National Trust have put his rent up by 25%. And they have said to him, if you don't take it, there are plenty of people who will. Have you tried bed and breakfast? You've got <laughs> Je you have a National a Trust gentleman coming in. Ask him if his wife yeah, is doing bed and breakfast. Uh, uh, Janet but, Daly, a last, a last quick question. Robert, if you aren't, aren't you confounding the economic issue, the economic hardship that the rural community is coming in for, for lots of reasons, to do with Brussels and to do with the economic community, with the more symbolic issue of its customs and traditions. And I understand what you mean about the insensitivity that's being shown to those customs and traditions by the sort of urban culture. But isn't it, isn't it aren't you sort of conflating the two in a way that is actually detrimental to your case? As a member of the rural community, uh, we are seeing the issues as one. We are seeing it is an attack against country people. I believe it is going to lead to suicides among the farming community in an alarming rate. There's always, we've been, had, a, there's always been a high rate of suicide among farmers. We've had CJD, farmers. 40 victims, mm -hmm. over 400 farmers have committed suicide mm -hmm. at the same time. And I believe we're going to get civil disobedience on a very large scale. Robin Page, thanks very much indeed. Our next witness is, uh, is from the National Trust, in fact, Peter Nixon, the uh, Director of Estates there. Um, it's irresistible, isn't it? Men in suits without roots, I think Robin Page said, uh, telling people who have got roots... <laughs> right, you're not wearing a suit. Um, uh, telling people who have got roots how to live their lives. You banned, I mean, basically you banned uh, stag hunting on Exmoor, haven't you? And you dicker with banning fox hunting, but I don't think you have on your land. No, yet. we don't dicker with banning fox hunting. Our, our position over hunting well, and field sports in general has been entirely consistent, which is that um, the Trust has sought not to make a decision based on emotional grounds and certainly um, not uh, sought to take any political position. If banning stag hunting is not made on emotional grounds, what uh, based in, on in a it, sentence is what it... Uh, it's based, on, it based on, on? on the, the scientific evidence that was available that startled a lot of people, including ourselves, that came from Professor Bateson's report. That the, 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 the stags get frightened? Uh, that stags, uh, that, that uh, deer, when hunted, suffer a very significant, um, to a very significant degree and to a much greater degree than the alternative which is shooting by rifle. Yeah. The Trust wholly accepts that deer have to be culled, but because of the very high degree of suffering shown through the Bateson report, and the Trust made its decision specifically on that basis. But elsewhere, with regard to other forms of hunting, um, providing it's not inconsistent with our policies elsewhere, um, then it continues to take place. I I'm still not quite clear. The fox doesn't get frightened, but the stag does. There's no evidence that the fox is, um, suffers a significant amount of hunting, and, and I think our, our position has been that a, well, a decision fox. shouldn't be taken um, to peremptorily stop fox hunting or any other form of hunting or other field sport uh, in the absence of um, uh, proper evidence, um, and for a decision to be taken on emotional grounds would probably be wrong. David Starkey, your witness. As I remember correctly, but don't let's waste time going over this, the Bateson report demonstrated the truly amazing fact that a hunted deer suffers from stress. It sounds like a poor thing in the office. Anyway, um, but can we turn this round the other way? The National Trust is a vigorous campaigning body. 
whose work I broadly very much support. Let me put my position clear. You campaign for the preservation of all sorts of things. Thatching, a bit of Morris dancing, wildflowers and cliff faces. Why aren't you campaigning? We heard what Robin Page was saying. Why aren't you actually campaigning for something as deeply traditional? You're advertising your roots as deeply rooted as hunting. The Trust isn't essentially a campaigning organisation, we're a doing organisation. We achieve our objectives um, through working with local communities all over England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and if we do speak out on issues, it's where it directly affects us and where we've got something to say that's rooted in our experience. We aren't a political organisation. Indeed, as a charity, it would be wholly wrong for us to take a political position over an issue such as hunting. What we do um, when we make a decision um, is to root it as far as is possible uh, on the basis of scientific evidence. But you say that you're about preserving villages forever, communities forever. We've heard vigorously these people in the Lake District, which you're responsible for, Exmoor, which you're responsible for. They care passionately. They're under attack every bit as much as the country house was. Why are you campaigned about country houses? Why are you so supine about people? We're not supine about people at all. I would say that it's probably right at the top of our agenda, working with local communities, working with people. And um, just to follow the point from Robin Page with regard to the farming community, I don't recognise that case he's spoken of at all. And um, my contact with the tenants in the Lake District have been extremely positive. The Trust has, over the last few months, committed £600,000 to specifically help our farming tenants. You're absolutely right. They're under great threat at the moment, and it's critically important that we all work to help them. But there's one other point, isn't there? The Trust talks about forever. It talks about that sense of the past, the present, the future. Exmoor, a large chunk of it, was left to you by a man called Ackland, wasn't it? It was, Sir Richard Ackland. And he felt very strongly about the continuance of stag hunting, didn't he? He expressed a wish um, which took into account the fact that circumstances change, not a specific obligation, a wish that stag hunting should continue, but his son, Sir John Ackland, has made it very clear that he supports the trust decision um, with regard to stag hunting and feels that, that his father would have supported that. Can I move but away from the I'm question? Yeah, David, 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 are, David, I think, you've, I think, I think you've there are far more important issues in the, in the countryside, as you said, Michael, yeah. at the beginning. It's relatively trivial hunting, very important to those who are concerned. The trust doesn't discount that for a moment, but there are much more important issues in terms of what can is I, happening in, in the countryside. Can I, can, Francis can, can Franklin? I ask how the trust decisions are made in the instance of Exmoor, which has obviously caused great uh, outrage about the, about the stags or whatever, how much is that decision made centrally on a London committee or how much is that done in consultation with the people who actually live there? The Trust um, had been considering the issue on Exmoor for uh, very specifically for 10 years and three reports were carried out and the first issue relating to deer hunting was raised in 1937 and so it's a long running issue with whom? With and a lot of discussion with, uh, there was discussion with local people discussion throughout the population as a whole um, in terms of decision making if one takes GMOs for example there's some issues that have to have a consistent national policy to make sense it wouldn't make sense is stag one of them uh, and, st and hunting is, is an issue like that in terms of matters where a so consistent the, the policy the national throughout decision the country matters more than the, than, the, than the local opinion and the opinion of the if people If a national decision is taken, it takes into account local circumstances, but at the end of the day, however account. venerable a, a, a local tradition may be, if there is an overriding circumstance which gives our council, our trustees, reason to believe that that's the route they should follow, um, then they follow their convictions, which is what happened in this case. Janet Dane. So, in effect, you only take the opinion of the local communities, the local villagers, when they agree with your particular prejudices and viewpoints? No, not at all. Um, there was one particular case with regard to hunting which is a very vexed issue across the board, which is why you're discussing it at such length now. Um, but in the vast majority of cases, wherever possible, the Trust allows decisions to be made at a local level. And that is in the vast majority of cases. It makes Decisions are made at a local level, but with people who share your particular view of the countryside, which, if I may say so, sounds rather like a theme park view of the countryside. You're very concerned Absolutely about country not, no. houses. I you're very concerned about scenic, what, what the pastimes that city people regard as quintessentially rural, but you're not interested in prejudices that conflict with your own when it comes to local people, local villages, uh, local I, communities. I absolutely dispute that. Um, we seek to work very closely with local people and I think you do a disservice to all of our tenants and all the other people who form parts of local communities with whom we work very closely. Of course we need to take account of their views and we need to work
work with them. Ian Harvey. How many members does the National Trust have? 2.6 million. What is the opinion of those 2.6 million people about the issue of fox hunting? Difficult to tell precisely, but I suspect, as with the country as a whole, fairly well split. But we've had two votes, um, and this is on deer hunting, um, so I can't really speak of terms of a vote recently with regard to fox hunting. But I think, I think you can take it that strong views expressed on both sides. Well, uh, but it, their views, in fact, are very likely to represent, as you say, the balance of opinion in the country, therefore to be overwhelmingly in favour of a ban on fox hunting. Why don't you pay any attention to that view? The trust decision-making process is through its council, and as with deer hunting, when there were in fact two votes prior to the trust decision being taken, which um, at our AGM, uh, representing our members' views, um, uh, which um, came to the conclusion the votes uh, passed a resolution that deer hunting should be banned, but the trust council felt that it would be wrong to take that action as trustees without very con carefully considering the impact of a ban, which was why, uh, in fact, the two reports that were commissioned, the Savage report before the Bateson report were undertaken. Now, the Savage report looked very carefully um, at a whole series of circumstances relating to hunting, its impact on local community, um, the relationship with regard to the local economy, etc. But are, are there any circumstances in which you would regard the overwhelming view of your membership as leading, uh, as requiring you to accept that view and act on it? Um, we would certainly feel that we had to take it into account, but the final decision has to be taken by our trustees who have to act in the best interests of the trust. Peter Nixon, thanks very much indeed. Our next witness is um, Juliet Galatli, who's director of VIVA, which stands for Vegetarian International Voice uh, for Animals, which I suppose tells us where you're coming from uh, uh, on all this. Uh, I uh, think it does. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, surely uh, man's relationship with animals has always been exploitative. Uh, why ban this particular form of ill treatment? I, I would like all forms of ill treatment to be banned, of course, but just because they're not being doesn't mean that they shouldn't be. I think it's particularly barbaric. Um, what never gets mentioned are things like the, the... In fact, the vast majority of foxes are killed by the terrier men who send down dogs after the foxes in their earths, and they can spend up to three hours getting the fox out. I've seen footage of um, a vixen being um, taken out of the um, earth who's been ripped to shreds by the dog she's been fighting, held by the scruff of the neck, and... All I can say is screaming in terror. That's how you, anybody would interpret it. And I can't see that in today's society that you can say that's right. 50,000 foxes are killed that way each year. And the other thing that's never mentioned is the cub hunting. Now, as many cubs are, as, are killed as adults, and yet we never hear about this in the media. OK, we can hear we, about it now. Janet Daly? <laughs> can we just um, leave aside the rather specialised question of fox hunting and talk about perhaps cruelty to animals generally, much of which takes place in the city. Would you want to ban halal butchery, for example, which is a peculiarly cruel way of killing animals for meat? Yes, religious, religious slaughter um, goes against the basic law of the land, which is that an animal has to be stunned before its throat is mm -hmm. cut. And there's huge scientific evidence to show so that the animal want, feels you pain. you would want to ban it? Absolutely. Even though it's fundamental to uh, the, the, the hundreds of thousands of people's religious beliefs? I don't think um, that cruelty can ever be justified. Right. Ever. So you're prepared to override any kind of cultural minority, not just rural people, but also religious minorities? Absolutely. Um, right. I mean, we have, all, we have all sorts of rules in this country. We don't allow multiple marriages. We don't allow well, clitorectomies. We do, actually. actually, we do. Um, Muslims are, are allowed to have multiple marriages. Well, there are many things that are banned here. Um, and I think that um, animals get the raw deal in this. I don't right. think you should be slitting so, the throats of fully conscious animals. So, um... What you're saying is that your own moral priorities, what you regard as immoral, should be illegal. I mean, for example, there are lots of things that many people consider to be immoral. Adultery, for example. But we don't make laws against them. We don't put people in prison for committing adultery or for lying or for being or for cheating. Or lots of things are immoral, but we don't make laws against them. No, you have to, you have to base society on certain um, precepts. And for me, that has to be based on outlawing things that are barbaric, that are um, unjustifiably cruel, and the victims are innocent. And in these cases that you're talking about, that, that those things are certainly the case. Does that include angling? Um, yes, it would, yeah. yeah. Does that include any form of meat-eating? Factory farming is abhorrent, no, absolutely. No, I mean, animals get killed for all sorts of purposes. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think the vast majority of people, if they went into an abattoir, into an abattoir would be deeply shocked. But you would, you, would, you, would, you, would you ban the eating of well, meat? Well, you have to remember, I mean, <laughs> going trying to ban things in that way is not going to work, is it, for most people? And they're going to find a way around it. So what we try to do as Viva is to educate people as to what's going on. So, for example, at the moment we're exposing the way you think the you most be, pigs are factory farmed. You think you would be able to educate Muslims out of their religious beliefs about halal butchery? Well, actually, Muslims within their own communities argue very viciously between themselves about whether animals should be stunned, and many Muslims do But stun. you think that the majority culture should have a right to ban a religious practice or I a think, custom I think Juliet's made, made that point. Mm -hmm. She does mm -hmm. think that. David, mm -hmm. David Starkey? 
could we try and get this broadened out? Because mm. I'm very worried about how you see animals and human beings. Can I put a case to you? Mm. We have a rare animal of an endangered species, say an Indian tiger or a snow leopard, which is about to kill a not very desirable human being in India. Would you hesitate before you shot the animal? I, I find these kind of hypothetical arguments pathetic, actually. We're in a situation now where we've got billions and billions of farm animals on this planet. Sorry, we're, could, we, could, we, you we may are, find, we are, the, you may find the question we're pathetic. We're just, no, we're destroying the planet because of intensive farming of the lands to feed those animals and because of the way those animals are kept. These are the real issues that I think we should be facing and dealing with. We cannot even feed the present population on the Western meat-based diet. It is totally inefficient. We are destroying our water supplies. We cannot feed these animals properly. Um, sorry, use, this use is, this is, sorry, can, I, use of pesticides. can I ask you at what least... We actually should sorry, be you're just ranting. Can I at least well, answer you? Ask I am you. telling you what Viva believes. Well, I'm not what we that, I'm interested, don't want to I'm, I'm, interested in an, I'm interested in an answer to my pathetic question. Would you consider, do you think in those circumstances that the animal should live as a human being? I can't answer because I'm not in that situation. I don't know what that human being's done. Has, so, he, has he just raped your daughter? Has he just murdered my brother? Would that make a difference? Would that make a difference? If I he just I raped your daughter, would it be all right for the tiger to kill him? I'm saying, for you as a person... If, no, no, if no, some, but sorry, that's not, it's it not would, an emotional... It it's would, not an emotional question. Jennifer, I might be inclined... No, I, I, think, I think it is an emotional on, question. question. No, no, hang I on. I might be inclined to kill somebody who just raped my daughter. That doesn't make it right. What I'm asking you, what David is asking you, is the moral principle. That's the question we're asking you to it's adjudicate a bit difficult, on the moral principle. It's a bit difficult, Can, can, can I ask you something? <laughs> the, Francis how, how much, at the end of the day, do you think that you're influenced by the fact mm. that you're not a meat eater, that you're a vegetarian. Can you conceive of an opinion that if you weren't, if you didn't say have that abhorrence, mm. that you would think vastly differently? Well, I became a vegetarian because of what I saw. I was brought up to eat meat, you know, all my life. So it was everything. in response to seeing It was in response to going into a factory farm which was can, government can, funded. Can you accept that somebody who didn't have that abhorrence could indeed think very, very differently oh, about all these issues? Well, of course people do. But what I have found, interesting, is there's been a huge change in public attitude in the last decade. And the vast majority of the public who we show factory farming, who bother to watch it, are deeply shocked by what they see. They don't like what they see. In you said, Juliet, that you would not ban all killing of animals for meat because you think it wouldn't stick. There'd be a, a rebellion against it. That's, that's your practical reasoning. What... What my belief is, is that you have to educate people and they have to understand why meat-eating is destroying the environment, why it's unhealthy yes. and why it hurts animals. So, but you don't think it's practical to go to the stage of, uh, of getting a ban on the killing of all animals yet, although you hope that perhaps we will get there in time. I wonder if you're prepared to entertain a practical argument about fox hunting. Uh, do you think that... Um, this government now leading us towards a ban on fox hunting is going to help the cause that you so passionately believe in. And why do you think that that is practically so? And deal with the argument that this is actually a small emotional distraction from much bigger issues which you care much more passionately about. I don't think see it as a small emotional distraction, um, certainly not to the 70,000 foxes in the way that they're killed. Um, I think most people see it as absolutely barbaric and they cannot understand how we're going to the new millennium with Britain still allowing this to be so when you've got over, well over 80% of the population against it. 80% of the population believe in hanging, don't they? I think with fox hunting, if, so, you, if you have a democracy and they ha people have free access to information, which is the crucial point for me... They do on hanging. And you debate a point, and you can show that that that, that, that cruelty is um, is obvious, and in this case it is. Then yes, it should be banned. Mm -hmm. It's important because. At the end of the day, we have to move forward as a society. We have to show we're compassionate, we're civilised, and if fox hunting still exists, then we're telling our children it, that it's OK to torture animals. Can it ever be wrong for a majority in a democracy to impose its will upon a minority? Yes, I think it can be. Juliet, I'm going to have to leave it there. Thanks very much indeed. Thank Our last witness is uh, Frederick Forsyth. Freddie Forsyth, the author, of course, and member of the uh, Countryside Alliance. Um, let them hunt, you say, uh, Freddie, as far as I can gather. Why? Tradition? Recreation? Job creation? No, oddly enough, I take a completely different view from all the, uh, the emotionally-based ones. I think it's a scientific question. And I think that, uh, uh, that uh, most legislation based purely on emotion, with no other mitigating factor at all, is usually extremely bad litigation. The argument being put forward by people like the PAL is wholly emotional. It has no basis in science. 
It seems to me that when you consider the position of the fox in the countryside, an apex predator, the biggest, the fastest, most powerful predator, meat-eating predator we've got in the countryside, that one really ought to answer two questions in, in sequence. Firstly, is there a case for controlling the total overall numbers of the fox uh, to prevent population explosion, which would be disastrous? And secondly, if the answer to that is yes, um, what is the least inhumane way of doing it? Now, these are two questions I can never get an answer to from the, what I call the passion lobby. They won't answer me. Ian Harvey. Well, we heard uh, an example debated at some length earlier of where an attempt had been made to, uh, to get scientific evidence in the case of uh, the Exmoor stags. Do you, did you regard that as a satisfactory scientific exercise? I don't know much about the Exmoor stags. What I heard later was that uh, Professor Bateson's evidence was not, in fact, peer-examined uh, at the time that it was first accepted. by the, la Later it was peer-examined, and I think the uh, National Trust reviewed and reconfirmed its ban. Um, I don't, however, think that uh, really it is a, say, the same. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not an expert, if you'll forgive my saying so, on the stag or the hare or the otter or the mink. I'm uh, not much of an expert on the fox either, but I mean, the fox is, as far I think as this argument goes, by overwhelming am amount the, 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 the issue we're really talking about. But, it, but isn't it simply fanciful to do what you, s what you are calling for, which is to try to reach a scientific view which will get us off the hook? This is something which has to be talked through, and it is an emotional, a cultural, a social question, whether we like it or not. No, it's a nice idea. That is, in fact, a, a copying out. If you want to um, get a really tough question for the abolitionists, why don't you ask them, why doesn't the government, at a stroke of the pen, transfer the fox from the vermin list to the protected species list? Well, th th that isn't an answer to the question because... Because uh, you can't answer it. Because nobody, uh, even the people who are against fox hunting, aren't denying that there needs to be control of the fox population. Yes, they are. I want, to ask, you, them are I want to ask you one other question. Uh, you speak for the Countryside Alliance, which just published uh, um, a fat booklet called Choose Livelihood about the issues facing the countryside. It doesn't mention uh, hunting at all, uh, this document. Why? Why is the Countryside Alliance so afraid of talking about fox hunting? Well, first of all, you flatter me. I'm not a spokesman for them. I assume I'm a member, as, as, as in the word foot soldier. I don't think that private <laughs> speak for the moment, generals. I'm afraid, and I haven't read the pamphlet, so I wouldn't know. I see. You're a member of an organisation whose pamphlet you don't read. Janet, Janet, Daly, can we, <laughs> Janet Daly, can we widen this yeah. rather to the perceived uh, imposition of urban values on country yeah. values? Yeah, I mean, why do you suppose it is that preventing cruelty to animals, I mean, there are lots of ways that that could be served, that cause, like making it illegal to keep large dogs in small city flats, for example. Why is it the case that rural callousness about animals is so much more heavily persecuted by government, particularly this government, say, than um, urban callousness to animals? I think, I think this government really has jumped on a bandwagon here because uh, there's been hunting for 300 years and there have been Labour governments, certainly for the past 90, 70 or 80 or 90. Um, this particular government, I think, sees a lot of advantage. For example, one might ask why the Prime Minister raised it a second time in one Parliament only a few nights ago. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that it has something perhaps to do with a million pounds from the PAL. It could even have something to do with diverting attention away from the almost lethal uh, interpersonal relationships inside the Cabinet. It, it might could have also have something to do, something to do Freddie, with, with the fact that it's a hugely popular... Uh, exactly, with votes. Uh, I think that's, that's a big uh, one. Uh, that a, many of the people who voted for him want it. Uh, Francis Fyfield. Do you, do you think, you, you're saying that this is, it can't be, uh, the fox hunting issue can't be in any sense an emotional issue, it should be just purely scientific, you know, is, the, is this a good way to get rid of foxes? But do you think um, that there are other things to be said for fox hunting too? What about the idea that really, I mean, we are a barbaric lot. Maybe there's something to be said for the idea that uh, we have to have a bit of bloodletting. And better, if you're going to have a bit of bloodletting, have it with rules. Well, you mean, let's have games, you know, a few gladiators. I mean, I, yes. I might take on Dr. Starkey sometime, or, or pick your weapon, Dr. Starkey. Mm. That sort of thing. No, I don't think that bloodletting, for its own sake, is therapeutic. I've never regarded it as such. I've seen a bit of bloodletting in Biafra and places. Never did me much good. But I, don't, I do think this is an e basically an ecological issue. There is a vast canon of evidence from serious scientists to say that the fox, without some element of population and, and control, would go out of control uh, uh, into population explosion and do a lot of damage. Uh, uh, and this wider issue of uh, the, the people in the countryside feeling that they're uh, downtrodden and, and you know, they're relegated in decision-making, that the urban people don't understand them imposing their values on them, uh, is that just whining? Um, I don't know. I, I, I take a, uh, perhaps not a, not, a, not a view that is, is wholly pro-countryside in there because it seems to me that the whining about townies coming to the countryside overlooks the amount of money and prosperity they bring. 
So when your pop millionaire moves into the Stone Manor house, which is a clapped out old ruin. <laughs> or indeed your best selling Yeah, he probably spends does, a million yeah. and a half on it, which means he employs stonemasons and plasterers and whatever. They are basically country people. So there's two sides of the story. The fellow who objects to someone's cockerel or the stench from, mm. the, from the manure spreading. Uh, and who pops off to London in his, in his jag to uh, make money in the stock exchange. Uh, if he didn't want uh, a cockerel and a bit of, bit of muck spreading, he shouldn't have gone to the country. <laughs> On the other hand, if he brings a million with him to spend among country people, that seems to be a pretty good idea to me. David Stark. Freddie, I'm worried about, as I think we all are, about your notion of absolute scientific tests. I don't think people riding to hounds have a notion that what they're doing is science. No, what they're doing no. is fun. Now, isn't human pleasure very important? And aren't most of the arguments about the countryside precisely arguments about competing forms of pleasure? It could well be, but Aesthetic. I think that you couldn't justify fox hunting if it was purely just, I enjoy doing it and therefore, wow, ain't it fun, so I ought to be allowed. You could just as well say, look, I rather enjoy buggering little boys. I happen to be a paedophile, so may I please no, no, carry no, no, on? Freddy, the answer can... is no, society does not no, permit no, you no, to do you, that. You're now going down the route of our third witness <laughs> and confusing human beings and animals. But no, what, no, we, no, no, what, no, what we need to do is... I'm to... saying pleasure alone cannot justify. Right. But, but, no, but, 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 assume, but assuming the fox is a legitimate target, mm -hmm. then we go back mm. to the point that was being made. Why is it better for some dour faced keeper to shoot it in cold blood than for somebody to enjoy killing it? Well, I don't think that again is the issue. I think it's my second question. What is the least inhumane way of doing it? And if you look at the various ways, they're all inhumane. Poison is indiscriminate, gassing is inhumane, leg traps are foul. Therefore, you might belief. as well enjoy it. No, I'm just saying that it comes down to the dog or the gun. And at the end of the day, People know very little about guns, if you'll forgive my saying so, I know quite a bit. You cannot guarantee to kill a fox cleanly with a gun. Where the dog at least has this advantage, this fox either escapes totally intact or it's dead. Ian Harvey's last question. The, the, there is something wrong with uh, taking pleasure in this, is there not? I mean, would it be morally OK uh, if you were going to, say, have your pet dog put down at the vet uh, to invite a busload of 40 people to come and watch? No, I don't think so, but I think this, uh, this is you know, part of the ignorance syndrome. When the fox actually dies, it is the lead hound who does the job with snapping its neck. It is not torn apart till it's dead, and actually most of the riders are half a mile away at the time. So if you wanted to watch the fox die, trap it in a net, put it in a pit, put some pit bull terriers in it, and then watch it. That's not the point. Freddie Forsyth, thanks very much indeed. Panel, what do we make of all this? Um, uh, uh, David Stark, you were a bit uh, dismissive of the uh, of the uh, the science in all this, uh, and and the idea that uh, the stag might be a bit upset by being hunted to death. I would have thought it was prima facie so completely obvious. The real question is how we weigh the so-called feelings of animals whatever we project onto them, against human feelings and the value of animals against the value of human beings. I happen to care much more strongly about human beings. And it seems to me that Freddie was, in fact, not advancing an argument that he should have done. If the fox has got to be killed, it seems to me that it is far better that it is done as a ritual, as a tradition, that something that people enjoy doing, that is a pleasurable activity. And, you know... I, I, and this human pleasure is a very good thing. It's not an absolute. It needs moderating by rules. But I've seen no convincing argument that the fox is such a valuable creature that I need to worry about oh, it. Oh, on the wider argument, Janet, uh, 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 Juliet, the, the vegetarian, who was actually a, a, a rather more consistent than David, um, David implied, uh, wanted to widen it out to this idea that the current uh, raising of meat and so on was destroying the environment. Was that an overstated argument? Well, it's a, it's a totalitarian argument that she was making. I mean, a, a profoundly illiberal argument, which is that her moral prejudices, her moral preference, should dominate everyone's religion, everyone's custom, everyone's tradition, and that seems to me an extraordinary thing to say in a democratic society. Um, but the argument about whether, I, I think David Starkey is accepting too much the animal rights argument, that what we have to argue about is whether the happiness of the fox is weighed against the happiness of the person. I don't think that is the more sophisticated argument against fox hunting. I think that is that human beings in their pleasures should not become barbaric. And I can, and I can accept that argument much more than I can except the rather inane argument about animals having rights. You were kinder with uh, the vegetarian argument, Ian. 
Uh, well, uh, perhaps uh, chiefly to uh, offset uh, the previous unkindness towards her. I think that her position uh, is consistent, but mm. the problem is that it requires uh, logic as absolute as that in the end to clearly defend uh, the, uh, the strong position against fox hunting. And, of course, that is where the politics of all of this falls apart. We are, most of the people, you know, the 70% of people who think we should ban fox hunting haven't thought it through, uh, and they are not prepared to be consistent in their attitude towards animals. I actually think treating animals well and without cruelty is enormously important. Makes I'm, them uh, taste better. But, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm afraid that uh, this fox hunting argument is not going to advance that cause one jot. Francis, you, uh, at the beginning you were talking uh, with broad uh, sympathy from your childhood about, uh, about the country. Don't country people uh, want it always? I don't... Uh, I don't uh, Keep the townies out, we'll have their money, thank you very much I don't indeed. think I, I've heard anything this evening which actually sort of changes what I, what I, what I first thought. I think the, the basic people thing... People really do. The, surprise, the, basic, surprise. The, the, basic, the basic thing that uh, uh, limiting it purely to fox hunting... Don't, what, I'm, I'm what, talking about what, the wider what, issue now. Yes, but uh, broadening it out from that is that really it's the the first part of something entirely undemocratic. It's a so-called lib liberal government, you know, using something um, in, in this way, um, you know, the thin end of the wedge of the loss of democracy. It's like saying, you know, we are here to support minorities, but not this mm. minority. Well, the, point, the point is that you have yeah. to have... It's so important for that you're going to waste valuable parliamentary time yes. with it for, mm. for a really cynical purpose, uh, I mean, which has nothing to do with some, the sometimes That it is, would make them mad. Sometimes it is right for uh, the majority to be tyrannical, but the reasons have to be powerful, and the reasons here are insufficiently and I don't powerful, think they are. insufficiently logical. They're opportunistic. The and there's an extraordinary discrepancy between the way this particular cultural minority is is being treated and the way we're being yes. encouraged to treat other cultural and religious minorities. Yes, there's, there's a dreadful, uh, a dreadful and I think extremely sinister um, side to it. Davis Duck, I'll leave the last word with you if you can be reasonably brief. I think that it is a symbol of short-term confused opportunism and it is thoroughly deplorable. Oh, too yeah, brief. Yeah. Uh, Janet? Are you um, capable of being brief as well? Yes, I mean, th there's, an there's an element of demagoguery in this, which mm. is uh, very unpleasant and unedifying. Yes, selective well, un target. <laughs> unspeakable, uneatable and unedifying. Thank you very much indeed. That's it for this week. From our panel, Janet Daly, David Starkey, Ian Hargreaves, and from Francis Fifield, and from me. Until the same time next week, goodbye and tally ho. The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs.